All right, so I'm aware that lunch is after me. So I will try and <laughs> the, the, the star of the day, and I will try and keep that in mind and, and stay on schedule. So I pre appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, to talk about the first book in my series that I'm writing on the war in Virginia from the moment Lee retreats across the Potomac following Gettysburg through the end of 1863. Uh, that's six months of Civil War history uh, that most people don't know anything about because very little has ever been written about it. Uh, historians like to follow the big battles and the big bloodbaths. And since the six months following Gettysburg uh, until you get to the end of 1863 do not produce one great big bloody battle, uh, very few historians have had any interest in that time period. Uh, and so if you are just a casual reader of Civil War history, it would be very easy for you to get the idea that we have Gettysburg, Lee gets away from Gettysburg, and then nothing happens in Virginia until the beginning of the Overland Campaign and the Battle of the Wilderness. Uh, history just sort of hits the fast forward button. Let's get to the next great bloodbath. Uh, and if you stop and you think about that for a moment, it really doesn't make much sense because it's hard to believe that two of the most important armies of the Civil War sit around for six months and don't do anything. Uh, and of course, uh, that's not true. I, I came to this subject uh, courtesy of uh, my mentor, Professor George Forgey at the University of Texas. He taught a class on the American Civil War Reconstruction. I was his teaching assistant. And one afternoon we were talking about uh, the relative importance of Gettysburg. Was it really the turning point of the Civil War or not? And Dr. Forgey uh, offered the opinion, which was novel to me at the time, that no, Gettysburg wasn't the turning point, just one more great big battle uh, like all the other great big battles in Virginia that leads you right back to the same stalemate that had existed before the Battle of Gettysburg. And that really intrigued me. And I thought, well, if the war is supposed to really hit a turning point at Gettysburg, then it should look very different after Gettysburg than it did before Gettysburg. So I went to read about what took place after Gettysburg in Virginia. And lo and behold, there wasn't anything to read. Uh, so I had to start digging through the regimental histories and the biographies and then ultimately the newspapers and the soldier letters and the soldier diaries. And I discovered that there was actually a great deal that took place in Virginia in those six months. There was a great deal of maneuver. There was actually a great deal of fighting is the period that is fraught with enormous strategic significance. And it's also the bridge between the Gettysburg campaign and the Overland campaign. You don't get the Overland campaign unless you fill in those six months and what happens in those six months. And ultimately, after about 20 years of research, that led me to the decision that I was going to write about this. I was going to try and fill in uh, that void. And three of the books have been published. The fourth book, which is on the Mine Run campaign, the final great campaign of 1863, is in process. Uh, I hope that we uh, get it into print uh, by late next year. But today we're going to talk about the first book, in the series, Mead and Lee after Gettysburg. So we all know where this story begins. July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, the great battle uh, in Pennsylvania, the battle that has become symbolic of the entire war, uh, which is kind of appropriate because in those three days, you sort of get the entire war, right? The first day, stunning Confederate success. The second day, a closely fought contest that waxes and wanes back and forth. It could go either way. The third day, Southern valor versus Union firepower. Uh, that leads ultimately to the end. So it is kind of the whole war uh, in petite and has come to symbolize it for most Americans in, in many ways. At the time, of course, it was three days in a war that had been going on for a very long time. And on July 4th, the sun came up, the two armies were still there, the war was still going on. Uh, and that evening, Lee begins his retreat toward the Potomac. Uh, it is a very rough retreat, the weather is awful, of course, the Confederate Army has been mauled at Gettysburg. So has the Union Army. It's lost 22,000 men and 300 officers. It's in as bad a shape as the Army of Northern Virginia is. Uh, Meade uh, starts out a day late in his pursuit of Lee. Uh, but when Lee finally gets to uh, the Potomac River at Williamsport, between Williamsport and Falling Waters, uh, he finds that recent rains have flooded the river. Uh, to make it now unfordable. Its uh, width is 1,500 feet, uh, and the current is running very, very fast. And worse, the bridge that he had left behind 
when he entered Pennsylvania, had been burned by federal cavalry on July 3rd, an all-around bad day for the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, both to its front and its rear. So he can't cross the river. All he's got is a single ferry. Uh, he can send some wounded to the south bank and bring some ammunition over to the north bank, but his army's not going to be able to cross back into Virginia until a bridge is built. And so as his engineers go into Williamsport and begin to tear down buildings to you know, cobble together the pontoons and the planking necessary to build a bridge, uh, the rest of the army has to turn and face the pursuing Federals. And it begins to dig in uh, very quickly. It digs in with skill. Uh, and uh, the Federal Army shows up a day later. Uh, as Meade's army is going into line, he looks at the Confederate position, a lot of it which cannot be seen. Uh, but what the Federals can see is strongly entrenched. Uh, it covers all the possible approaches to it. Uh, and so it's a very, very dangerous uh, position. Uh, Meade uh, is thinking about launching a reconnaissance in force on the 13th. Uh, the night before on the 12th, he has a council of war, finds out that a good many of his corps commanders are against moving on the 13th. They want more time to examine the Confederate position. Reinforcements are supposed to be coming in. Uh, and Meade agrees to delay uh, for at least a day. And he sends word of that to Washington. And when General Halleck, the Union General in Chief, hears about that, uh, he, he howls in protest, you know, no councils of war. They never fight. You are to attack immediately. Do not let Lee escape. And so now Meade, who remember has only been in command of the army since three days before Gettysburg. So he's not even two weeks in yet, uh, knows what is expected of him on the morning of the 14th. He sends his skirmishers forward to probe the Confederate line, and lo and behold, the Confederates are gone. They had slipped across the river the night before on that air stats bridge uh, that Lee's engineers had built, uh, and the Army of Northern Virginia has gotten away in what is obviously a very orderly retreat. Uh, so now Meade has to send word of this uh, disappointment to Washington, uh, and when that news reaches the federal capital, things really pop. Uh, Lincoln is devastated. He believes, rightly or wrongly, that Meade has lost the great chance to end the war. Remember, Vicksburg and Port Hudson have fallen, uh, you know, and Lincoln, with those two successes, if we destroyed Lee's army, this thing is as good as over. Uh, whether it was within Meade's power to destroy Lee's army at Williamsport is going to be forever debated. Uh, there were differing opinions at the time, just as there are differing opinions now. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is Lee has gotten away. Uh, and so Halleck sends word back uh, to Meade uh, that the enemy should be pursued and cut up wherever he may have gone. I need hardly say to you that the escape of Lee's army without another battle has created great dissatisfaction in the mind of the president. And this leads to one of the great uh, emotional blow-ups in Civil War history because that word dissatisfaction sticks in Meade's crawl. He's exhausted. He's hardly slept. He's hardly eaten. He's fought a great battle only three days after taking command of the army. He's conducted a difficult pursuit. He thinks he's done everything that could have been done, uh, and he thought he had more time to strike Lee. He's surprised that Lee has managed to cross the flooded Potomac River. Uh, this dissatisfaction carries uh, a sense of condemnation. Uh, and so Meade's like, hey, look, I didn't want to take command of this army. I tried to refuse it. I was told I couldn't refuse it. And this is so unfair and it's so unjust. I demand to be replaced. Well, you can't replace the victor of Gettysburg <laughs> within two weeks of that great battle. Meade is the first Union general who can really claim that he's beaten Robert E. Lee ever. Uh, and so... Halleck has to change the language. He sends word back, oh, look, 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 don't let the president's dis disappointment trouble you. We're all disappointed, you know, uh, and, and Meade accepts that. Okay, that's a pseudo apology. But this order that he's just been issued on July 14th, the Confederate army should be pursued and cut up wherever it may have gone, indicates something very important, something that's always overlooked in the histories of the Gettysburg campaign. That campaign does not end when Lee retreats across the Potomac. It is far from over. Just like the day after the battle, the sun came up, the two armies are still in the field, operations are ongoing. The same thing is true on July 14th and 15th of 1863, just as they were on July 4th and 5th of 1863. Meade is expected to cross the river and try and bring the Army of Northern Virginia 
into battle. And so we get the subject of this book and this talk, the forgotten final two weeks of the Gettysburg campaign. And you see the vital part of it here writ large on this screen uh, with uh, the Army of Northern Virginia being the red, the Army of the Potomac being the blue, and the Confederates here in the Shenandoah Valley, the Federals in the Loudoun Valley with the Blue Ridge Mountains and a flooded Shenandoah River between them, almost sealing them off from each other except for these passes here, which will become the vital terrain. Uh, Lee has taken his army into the valley, but he lingers. He does not, as Meade expects him to, keep retreating south. Uh, so he puts uh, two of his corps, Hills and Longstreet's, into camp around Darksville, which is 11 miles north of Winchester. Ewell's corps goes into camp at Bunker Hill, uh, which is a couple of miles uh, above uh, Darksville, uh, and he's going to rest his troops there. He also needs to buy time to send 4,500 federal prisoners, 26,000 head of cattle, 22,000 uh, sheep south to the railroads at Stanton, plus all of his wounded in that 15-mile-long wagon train of misery has to get to Staunton uh, to meet the railheads so that they can be taken to the hospitals around Richmond uh, and elsewhere. And that, of course, is a very slow-moving procession. And so he needs to hold in the lower valley uh, for some time so that all of that logistical business can get out of his uh, way. Uh, but that hardly means that the campaign here is going to hit a pause. In fact, something uh, quite different, because remember that Halleck had ordered reinforcements to the Army of the Potomac, expecting a great big battle on the banks of its namesake river. A lot of those reinforcements are going to be pretty much worthless. They're emergency militia. Tens of thousands of them that have been called out and need to, as discussed, is going to find out that all of those troops are not going to cross into Maryland. The Pennsylvania militia is like, hey, we signed up to defend Pennsylvania. Lee's gone from Pennsylvania. We're done. Uh, you know, and our enlistments are going to expire in about 30 minutes and then we're going to go home. Uh, and at any rate, they would have been useless against Lee's veterans and Meade's estimation anyway. But some troops who might help him uh, belong to Brigadier General Benjamin Kelly, uh, who commands the newly created Department of West Virginia, which had just been born as the Gettysburg campaign uh, commenced in June of 1863. Uh, Kelly's troops have been spread out guarding the uh, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and the B&O Canal and that sort of thing. So it, he'd been ordered to gather them together, go to reinforce Meade. It had taken him a long time to pull all of his men together. Uh, and he gets to Williamsport on the morning of July 15th, and he looks around and everybody's gone. The Confederates have retreated below the Potomac. Meade has shifted his army eastward toward Berlin, Maryland, where he expects to cross the river. And so Kelly... Uh, telegraphs Halleck in Washington says, hey, look, I've come to reinforce the Army of the Potomac, but it isn't here, and I don't know where it's gone. What do you want me to do? And Halleck says, what I want you to do is I want you to cross the Potomac and do as much harm to the enemy as you can. Kelly's got 6,000 men and a couple of batteries of artillery, uh, and it's a very mixed force, a little cavalry, some mounted infantry, some foot infantry. A lot of these troops have never seen combat. He's just been told, you've got to cross a swollen river, uh, you have no bridging equipment, and I want you to go chase the Army of Northern Virginia with your 6,000 men. And Kelly's like, whoa, I'm not so sure I want to do that. But orders are orders, and so he begins to cross the river. He's got three boats to do it, three little skiffs. And so it's going to take him three days. Uh, and the, the river is at such a state of flood that on every trip, his boats are swept a half mile downstream. So between the north bank and the south bank, they go a half mile. And then you've got to get them back. And so it's a very daunting and difficult task. You see where he crosses here uh, at, at Cherry Run Ford, uh, that picture of it in the lower left hand. Almost everything in that picture would have been underwater in July of 1863, except that mountain in the background. So Kelly uh, is the first federal force uh, to cross into the Shenandoah Valley on the western side of the valley. At the same time, federal forces on July 14th have crossed into the eastern side of the Shenandoah at Harper's Ferry. That morning, 3,400 federal troops under General Negley have crossed the river. They've come down from Maryland Heights where they've been sitting all throughout the invasion of Pennsylvania. Uh, they get control of the town. 
The 50th New York Engineers throw up a pontoon bridge. That afternoon, two brigades of Brigadier General David Gregg's 2nd Cavalry Division trot across the river. They don't know that Lee has made his escape. Gregg's mission is to get south of the Potomac and cut Lee's supply line to sort of cut the south bank of the Potomac off uh, from Lee's army, which is still considered to be uh, on the north bank. On the morning of July 15th, Gregg sets out to carry out that mission. He rides toward Charlestown, Virginia, runs into Confederates of Grumble Jones Cavalry Brigade. Opposition's stiffer than he thinks, so he swings north to see if he can cut Lee's supply line a little further uh, toward the Potomac. And on the evening of July 15th, 1863, he occupies Shepherdstown, Virginia. So he leaves some troops at Hallstown. There are Confederate troops in Harpers Ferry. Now he's at Shepherdstown. And this cuts off Company D of the 12th Virginia Cavalry. It's only 100 guys, but they're going to turn out to be very, very important. Also, it helps that they were raised in this part of Virginia, so they know every nook and cranny. So instead of being cut off trying to get back to their regiment, they're going to operate behind federal lines for a while. And that's going to be very beneficial to the rebels because Lee and Stewart have heard about Gregg's incursion below the river. And so Stewart is ordered to smash this Yankee force and drive it at least back into Harper's Ferry. On the afternoon of July 16th, 1863, this leads to a very dramatic cavalry battle uh, outside of Shepherdstown. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting fight. We don't really have a lot of time to go into it here. Uh, but the uh, Confederates enjoy some initial success, drive the forwardmost federal units back into a wooded ridge where they have the cover of woods uh, and a stone wall. Uh, the Confederates bring up their uh, horse artillery. This fight is mostly com is completely done dismounting uh, because this part of the valley is just littered with stone fences and rail fences. It's not a place where you got to move mounted troops around. Uh, one Confederate participant called it a great fight of sharpshooters, uh, and anybody who poked their head up above a stone wall was apt to get blown off very quickly. One Confederate regiment loses two color bearers in a row in almost a minute, and uh, the third guy pulls the flag up while crouching down below the wall. So the flags that he's down, he, he, he's figured this out. Uh, so it's a touch and go thing. At the very end of the day, uh, the Confederates get some reinforcements. They manage to puncture the federal flank, drive it back a quarter of a mile, but nightfall comes before anything decisive can happen. Uh, Greg has been holding on, waiting for reinforcements from his third brigade under Pinnock Huey, uh, which had been ordered to join him, but given no sense of urgency in that, it trots across the river on uh, mid-morning of the 16th, rests for a little while in Harper's Ferry, uh, and then it gets a message from Greg, hey, I'm in a fight. I need your help. You need to get here as quickly as you can. So Huey begins to head toward Shepherdstown, and as he does so, he runs into this little company, Company D of the 12th uh, Virginia Cavalry, which has been waylaying federal stragglers. It's captured Greg's supply wagon and his headquarters wagon and that sort of stuff. And so it's looking for federals. It finds them. There's a little skirmish with an outpost patrol of this little company, but that's enough to scare Huey into thinking, oh my gosh, I run into Confederates and they might attack me. So he pulls up his whole brigade. He deploys it in the line. He unlivers his artillery and he sits there for the rest of the afternoon waiting to be attacked. So like 12 Confederates have, have caused this entire federal brigade to stop in its tracks until dark. And then after dark, he goes up and he gets to, uh, he gets to Greg at Shepherdstown and he says, you know, there are Confederates behind us. There are Confederates all, all over the place behind you. We're cut off. We got a flooded Potomac to the north. You got Confederates in front of us and we got Confederates to our rear. We're surrounded. And certainly they weren't surrounded. But perception is reality. And so Greg is almost out of food and ammunition. He says, I got to get out of here because Stuart's going to attack me in the morning. And that was Stuart's intention. And I'm going to get wiped out if I don't escape. So the Federals spend the night riding in single file along the banks of the flooded Potomac on a tiny little trail to get themselves back to Harper's Ferry. And at dawn, they're just getting there, but in time to get away from Stuart. And so this chance to destroy Greg's cavalry division, it comes to nothing. But Greg has been shoved back into Harper's Ferry. He's no longer a threat to Lee. 
what is the rest of the Army of the Potomac doing? Well, the rest of the Army of the Potomac has moved down to Harper's Ferry in Berlin, Maryland. And Meade is throwing bridges across the river at Berlin, Maryland. That's a little bit complicated because the river's too wide uh, and his engineers don't have enough bridging material to span the stream. Uh, so they send word back to Washington, hey, we need more bridging material. Governor Warren is still the chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac. He says, I need you to send me all this stuff by rail. Don't send it by the canal because the Confederates have damaged the canal and the canal's inoperative. So the word gets to Washington and they hear, I need bridging material. And they don't hear, don't send it by the canal. So they send it by the canal. So of course it doesn't get there in time. So the whole federal army is going to be stymied, except for the fact that the 15 New York engineers who have started spanning the river see all this trash rushing down on the current toward them. And they realize, oh, this is the Confederate pontoon bridge at Williamsport that leads to Troy. And so they grab all the parts and pieces of that and they add it to their own bridge so that they can get a span over the river. And as soon as they get that done, what happens? Well, all the equipment from Washington shows up. Good old army fashion, a day late, but they use that to build a second bridge over the river. And so Meade is now uh, in a situation where he can move the Army of the Potomac into Virginia. He's not going to take it into the Shenandoah Valley. That would be pointless, you know, just sort of poking Lee in the rear. He can retreat fast in front of me. Instead, Meade makes a very sound strategic decision. He's going to the Loudoun Valley. He's going to be on Lee's strategic flank between him, really, and Central Virginia. And if things were to work out right, the Federals might be able to push through these gaps in the uh, Manassas, uh, or the, rather the Blue Ridge Mountains, and get into the Shenandoah Valley and maybe fight Lee there. Does Meade think that this is the right strategy to pursue? And the answer is, he most certainly does not. And even as his army is crossing into Virginia, he's writing to his wife on July 18th uh, that the proper policy of the government should have been to be content with getting the Confederates out of Maryland. And after that, we should have halted and done nothing until this army is reinforced and reorganized and put in a condition where it can actually achieve something, uh, where it has a good chance of success. As it is, I've got a mauled army uh, chasing the rebels into their own territory. He's got complete strategic freedom of maneuver. What am I going to accomplish? And if I can even bring him to battle, I'm not sure my army is in a condition to fight a battle. And if it fights a battle, it's very possible I will lose that battle. Uh, so he kind of wants to do what McClellan had done after Antietam, but he's aware that that got McClellan fired. And Meade doesn't want to be fired. He knows what his orders are. So he's going to go ahead and he's going to cross the river. Uh, this is a picture of the two pontoon bridges at Berlin, Maryland. You can see something about how wide the river was. Uh, that's where the Federals come over the river. So that by the end of July 18th, about half of the Army of the Potomac is in the Loudoun Valley. Well, that same day, Custer's Cavalry Brigade has seized Snickers Gap, which is the first of the important gaps in the Blue Ridge Mountains. You can see the red circles there are the Confederate Army. Lee's still in the lower valley. He's still resting his troops, letting all those prisoners and all that booty uh, from Pennsylvania head toward Staunton. He's not sure where Meade is. Meade doesn't know where Lee is. There's a veil that's fallen between these armies because of the mountains and the flooded Shenandoah. So both Lee and Meade are operating in complete darkness, having to make assumptions about each other. Uh, and so because of this, uh, you're going to have the first important events take place, not on the eastern side of the Shenandoah, but on the western side. So Kelly has managed to get his forces over the river. On July 17th, he occupied Hedgesville, uh, and uh, then he sends word to you know Halleck, I'm going to advance on Martinsburg, and I'll occupy that place if there aren't too many Confederates there. Uh, and so on July 19th, he sends a brigade under Brigadier General William Averell uh, toward Martinsburg. Uh, they run into Confederate cavalry, which retreats in front of them. Close to Martinsburg, Ewell sends a couple of regiments out to support the cavalry. And at that point, Averell acts on his orders from Kelly, don't poke the hornet's nest. 
there are a lot of Confederates over here, and if and if the Army of Northern Virginia is around, our six thousand men are in a hopeless situation. So don't start a great big fight. If you run into serious resistance, back up. And so that's what he does. The Confederates follow him. There's some skirmishing, not many casualties. By the end of the day, the Federals are back in Hedgesville. The Confederates still have Martinsville. Uh, but now both sides know where one another is. Uh, the Confederates had no idea there were Federals on the western side of the Shenandoah Valley. And Kelly now knows that the Army of Northern Virginia has not retreated up the valley or southward uh, in the valley. It's still close to the Potomac. And that knowledge is going to turn out to be uh, particularly important here. Uh, so by the end of July 19th, the rest of the Army of the Potomac is in the Loudoun Valley. You can see that it's on the strategic flank of Lee's Army. Lee's Army is where it has been since it crossed the Potomac. Uh, but Lee is increasingly concerned that he doesn't know where Meade is. And Stuart cannot give him very much in the way of intelligence because Stuart can't get his cavalry across the Shenandoah, which is flooded to do any reconnaissance work. But he is getting some information across. He knows that the Federals have taken Snicker's Gap. And on that thin read, Lee is going to make a decisive uh, choice. He's like, the most dangerous thing that Meade could do is to get into the Loudoun Valley and try and seize the mountain passes and trap me in the Shenandoah. And although I don't know that that's what he's doing, I'm going to assume that he's going to do the thing that is most dangerous to me. So Lee writes to James Longstreet on the evening of the 19th, and he tells him, I want you to take your corps, which of course includes Hood's Texas Brigade, and I want you to move toward Front Royal, cross the mountains at Chester's Gap, and then take a position in Culpeper County on the headwaters of the Rappahannock River. He sends word to A.P. Hill, I'm probably going to have you follow Longstreet uh, very quickly. He sends word to Yule, not yet. But within a few days, you're probably going to head into central Virginia, too. Until then, if there's any intelligence that you've gathered that I should know, inform me. Well, Yule, who's just had a fight in front of Martinsburg that day, sends word to Lee. Yes, I do know something you might be interested in. I think there are 10,000 Yankees in Hedgesville in the northwestern corner of the Shenandoah Valley. And I would like to go out and destroy them. And Lee likes the sound of that. It's good to hear Yule being aggressive after his disappointing performance at Gettysburg. And Lee says, you have my permission uh, to go after these Federals. Uh, so on July 20th, things are going to start to happen. Longstreet's going to go toward first Millwood at, at, uh, on the west bank of the Shenandoah for Ashby's Gap. Then he's going to move down to Front Royal so that he can be, begin to cross the mountains. Yule is going to start laying plans to attack and destroy Kelly's force. The Federal Army is going to continue to move south in the Loudoun Valley. But that evening, Meade gets a roundabout report through Maryland, the first solid intelligence he's had of Lee's whereabouts since the retreat at Williamsburg. And he's going to find out about the fight that had just happened at Martinsburg. And this is very disturbing information. Lee's at Bunker Hill, Yule at Darks Hill, Hood with five brigades at Gerardstown, the Confederate cavalry at Martinsburg. Lee isn't retreating southward in the Shenandoah Valley. He's not trying to get back into central Virginia, as Meade has supposed. He's still in the lower valley. He's within a dozen miles of the Potomac River. And this floors me. This doesn't make any sense. The Confederate Army ought to be retreating. Why is it not retreating? And then Meade remembers that as soon as he crossed the Potomac, he had seen Southern newspapers claiming that massive reinforcements were being sent to the Army of Northern Virginia, that troops from Tennessee were on their way to reinforce Lee, that troops from the Carolinas were on their way to reinforce Lee. And at first, Meade had sort of poo-pooed them. He sent it on to Halleck and said, hey, you know, if you hear anything that confirms this, I assume you'll let me know. And he sort of feigns that, nah, this isn't you know, happening. But he writes his wife saying, this is probable. The Confederates are very likely to be reinforcing me. Because if you're just thinking in theory, of course they would reinforce the Army of Northern Virginia, right? It's just had this big bloodletting. It would need to be reinforced. You look at the strategic context, where are the Confederates going to get these reinforcements from? Their Western situation is deplorable. 
Charleston's under heavy siege. And Halleck is going to tell me, you don't have to worry about Lee being reinforced. Not a single man is going to reinforce Lee. And even if he did, you're still much stronger than him. But Meade doesn't buy that. The only thing that makes sense, the only thing that explains Lee staying in the Laura Valley is that he's waiting to be reinforced. And once he's reinforced, as apparently is what's happening, he's going to do one of two very dangerous things. He's going to recross the river, reinvade the north. And if I'm in the Loudoun Valley and he crosses the river, he's getting between me and Washington. If he doesn't do that and I keep going south in the Loudoun Valley, he can pop through one of those passes behind me and get between me and Washington. And then my army will be cut off from communication and supply and I'm going to be in a desperate situation. He doesn't know for sure this is what Lee is doing, but he's not going to take the chance that Lee might do these things. And so he orders his infantry to stand down. His infantry is not going to take another step for the next 35 hours. Buford's cavalry will continue south to try and grab Manassas Gap and Chester's Gap, but the federal infantry is going to have a day off. Plus, a half a day after that, which the troops, of course, enjoy a great deal. But this is akin to surrendering the strategic initiative to Robert E. Lee, which is something that no wise federal commander would ever do, because Lee knows how to take advantage of that. So, July 20th of 1863, that evening, the Federals are, are, are going to stop moving. The Confederates, however, are moving all throughout that day. So you can see that Longstreet has shifted over uh, toward the uh, Shenandoah River, his L down there at Millwood. Another important thing is happening here. So as soon as Richmond had heard about the defeat at Gettysburg, it had ordered one of the two brigades from Pickett's division that had been left behind in Virginia to guard the Virginia Central Railroad to go and reinforce the Army of Northern Virginia. That brigade, 1,200 men, all Virginians, under Montgomery Course, started off from Central Virginia on July 9th, marched 100 miles through mud and rain, got to Winchester, Virginia on the 13th, reported to Pickett, and Pickett says, look, we're probably going to be moving south soon. There's no need for you to march those last five miles to where I'm at. You stay in Winchester. And that turns out to be one of the most important decisions that George Pickett's ever going to make in his military career. Because what that means is on the morning of July 20th, when Longstreet's starting this long march down from Bunker Hill, Horace is moving straight south from Winchester toward Front Royal. And Front Royal is going to be the critical ground because Front Royal is the western exit of two gaps in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Manassas Gap, which is there on your left, and Chester's Gap, which is there on your right. This now becomes the most important piece of property in the United States in July of 1863. If you want to see it on a map, a sort of aerial view, you can get the gist of it here. Control Front Royal, you control those two gaps. If Meade could shove his way through those gaps and seize Front Royal, he would have a chance to slice into the Shenandoah Valley and cut Lee off so that Lee would be trapped on the north bank of the Potomac River in a way similar to what had been the case at Williamsport earlier on. So Course manages to get to Front Royal. The river's flooded. This is where the two forks of the Shenandoah come together. So there's a north fork and a south fork. He has to cross both of them. Lee has sent a pontoon bridge down to bridge the rivers, but it hasn't even begun to be started. And so his men have to ford the river, and it's flowing so swift that what the troops of the Texas Brigade do is they lock arms, five or six of them at a time, and then they walk across the river supporting each other uh, like that. Their, their weapons go over on small boats, but they have to ford the river. Officers on horseback are there for any man who slips and begins to be swept downstream to, to save them. Uh, and that has to happen on several occasions. But Corse manages to get his men uh, across the river, and then he sends most of his brigade down into Chester's Gap, along with the Battery of Artillery, because that's the gap the Confederates are planning to use. But Manassas Gap, which is more rugged and to the north, just a few miles to the north at the 
eastern exit, but very close at the western exit in the Shenandoah Valley, that can't be ignored. And so he sends um, Colonel Robert Simpson uh, with the 17th uh, Virginia uh, to plug that gap. Uh, and this is a good choice because Simpson was from Front Royal area. He taught school there before the war. So it's an inspired choice. This is a guy who knows the terrain. Uh, so the Confederates moved into the, uh, the gap. And the apex of the gap here is Linden. That's, oh, sorry. We'll go back here. Linden is the highest point in Manassas Gap. Wapping Heights is the high ground just to the west of Linden, and it takes its name from an old stagecoach stop called Wapping Heights, right there. And uh, what Simpson does is he deploys his regiment here. He sends some men out to be uh, skirmishers. He thinks there's Confederate cavalry in front of him, but there's not. Uh, what is in front of him is Wesley Merritt's cavalry brigade, his reserve cavalry brigade, which is operating under Buford's command. And... He had occupied Linden the afternoon before, and now he's got new orders from Meade. I want you to push on toward Front Royal. So the Federal Cavalry begins to ride toward Wapping Heights. They run into the Confederate skirmishers, attack them, capture half of them, but the other half manage to raise the alarm, and the Federals try and thunder down this very narrow gap. Uh, they run into Simpson's troops, who manage to repel them, and this starts a day-long fight uh, where what now is about 250 Confederates are holding off an entire Federal Cavalry Brigade. The fortunate thing for the Confederates is that Merritt doesn't know he's just facing a single regiment. And so he doesn't throw his whole force at them. He throws it at them piecemeal, which allows them to uh, hold the Federals off with the benefit of very rugged terrain. Simpson had sent a rider back for reinforcements. As soon as the encounter began, he finds Pickett's division and Pickett is only a couple of miles from Front Royal, and so he races to the rescue. Uh, he sends uh, Joseph Cabell, who's got what's left of Armistead's brigade, only about 600 men at this point, to reinforce Simpson at Chester's Gap. The rest of the division goes to reinforce Corse, who's facing uh, William Gamble's Federal Cavalry Brigade in Chester's Gap. And with the arrival of these Confederate reinforcements, Merritt is pushed back into Linden. Uh, one of the really interesting things that happens here is that Merritt sends a message back to Buford, who sends it on to Pleasant, and who sends it on uh, to me. He says, you know, when this thing started, I thought I was opposing just a regiment. But now I think I'm opposing an entire division because Confederate prisoners are telling me that I've been fighting Simpson's Brigade, which is part of Herbert's division. In other words, the Confederate prisoners were telling really good lies. And the Federals were buying all of it. And so Merritt says, wow, I'm in trouble. I've got a cavalry brigade facing an entire Confederate division. I can't do anything else here. Gamble has managed to block the eastern exit of Chester's Gap. But, of course, what's about to be in front of him is an entire Confederate corps, although he doesn't know that uh, quite yet. What Merritt and Gamble need more than anything else right now is federal infantry to come in and stiffen their hold on these two gaps. But where's the federal infantry? It's in camp. It's washing its clothes and writing letters and resting its sore feet because it is not uh, moving. So the fight at Manassas Gap or the, uh, was a very important fight. It, it, it holds the critical ground uh, as far as the Confederates are concerned. That same day, there's also movement on the western side of the Shenandoah. So remember that on the 20th, Ewell had told Lee, Kelly is in Hedgesville, I want to attack him. And Lee has said, you have permission to go after him. That evening, Ewell holds a conference with his division commanders, Allegheny Johnson, Robert Rhodes, and Jubal Early, in the home of one of his staff officers outside Martinsville called Boydville. Very beautiful place. It still exists. They hold weddings and stuff there now. You can go see it. And it's a very convenient spot for a strategy conference. Very comfortable spot for a strategy. Even more comfortable because one of the friends of the owners of Boyville, loan a slave to tend to the needs of the general. This slave apparently is really good at mint juleps. And so that's all very nice, but here's the problem. Lucinda Pendleton, who sent the slave over, is a unionist. And she told the slave, when you're around Confederate officers, 
eyes and ears open. And so the slave hears the Confederates plot. They're going to send Hampton's Cavalry Brigade, now under Lawrence Baker, Hampton and Moonwood at Gettysburg, and Early's Division into Back Creek Valley. And they are going to move up Back Creek Valley to strike Hedgesville from the rear. At the same time, Rhodes and Johnson will advance on Hedgesville from the Shenandoah. They'll attract Kelly's attention. He'll face them. Early will come in and hit him from the rear and surround these Federals, and we're going to destroy them. And that plan would have probably worked, except the slave goes back and tells Mrs. Pendleton what he heard. She tries to send the slave through Confederate picket line to tell Kelly. The Confederate pickets turn the slave back. So then Mrs. Pendleton sends her 10-year-old son with an empty basket, claiming that he's going out to pick blackberries, which glow in profusion over the valley in this period of the year. And the Confederates let him through. And he goes to the federal picket line. He says, I need to see General Kelly. And the federal pickets are, sure, you do, Sonny. You know? But the boy is insistent. He won't talk to you. So they take him to the general. And the first thing the boy tells, you're all going to be killed. <laughs> and, and Kelly's like, whoa, son, calm down. Why don't you sit on my lap? And he finally manages to extract enough information from the, the boy to become concerned. This sounds very plausible. He sends cavalry into Back Creek Valley. They see the Confederate campfires. And Kelly says, you know the one thing I'm not going to do? I'm not going to stay where I'm at. I'm not going to stay on this side of the Potomac. And so he has his men build their campfires up to make it look like they're still in camp. And then he makes a run for it. And the Confederates, of course, begin their advance the next morning. But as Yule, I'm sorry, as Early and, and uh, Baker get to Hedgesville, the Federals are gone. Confederate cavalry goes to the river and they get there just in time to see the last boatload of Yankees reach the Maryland shore. So you shoot Kelly away, but this is a big disappointment. The Confederate press had a lot of fun with the Yankee skedaddle. But now the Confederates under Ewell, Rhodes and Johnson, go back to their camp at Darksville. Ewell's other division under Early stays in Hedgesville and now becomes the northernmost part of the Army of Northern Virginia, along with Hampton's Cavalry Brigade. And that's going to be important because the Federals now have observers up in the mountains. And although the haze has made it difficult, it's beginning to clear up. They can see into the Shenandoah Valley and the Federal intelligence is now going to get scrambled. They're going to think that Early's division is Ewell's entire corps. And they're going to think that Yule's division is Hill's, or Hill's, Yule's other two divisions are Hill's Corps. So they're messing up where the Confederates are, and this is going to turn out to be very, very important. So at dusk on July 21st, this is where the armies are. Longstreet has reached Front Royal. He's preparing to push through Manassas Gap. Hill has marched down to Winchester. Uh, two of Yule's divisions are at Darksville, early still up there uh, at uh, Hedgesville. Stewart's been ordered to come down to Front Royal and to follow Longstreet through Manassas Gap. The Federal Infantry, of course, is still sitting around. It sat around all through the 20th. It sat around through the first half of the 21st. But by 11 a.m., enough intelligence is being gathered from Meade's signalmen on top of the mountains who are looking down the Shenandoah Valley to say the Confederates are retreating. We see these long columns of troops heading south. We see these long wagon trains heading south. And so Meade finally decides, okay, Lee's not about to reinvade the North. He's not about to try and get behind me. He's trying to cross the mountains and I need to stop him. And because he thinks that Early's division is Ewell's entire corps, and he thinks that Rhodes and Johnson's division are Hill's entire corps. He believes there's a chance that if he can shove through Manassas Gap and take Front Royal, he can cut off two-thirds of Lee's army. Longstreet's probably going to get away, but I can cut off the other two-thirds and I can destroy it by throwing the entire army of the Potomac against it. Of course, this is not correct. This is a misunderstanding of what's going on. But still, even if he could get Front Royal, he would potentially trap Ewell's Corps, a third of Lee's army. And if he could destroy that, that's not small potatoes. That, that would go a long way toward wrecking uh, Lee's army. And so, July 22nd, Longstreet begins to move through Manassas Gap. 
He's got Wolford's brigade at the front of his column. Wolford gets to the eastern exit. He finds Gamble's cavalry and a battery of artillery in front of him in very defensible terrain. And Wolford says to Longstreet, you know, the one thing I don't want to do after Gettysburg is any more of this frontal attack business. So I suggest we try and outflank these guys. We'll use Pickett's division, or at least the two brigades that are here. They'll march through the mountains. They'll come around and hit the, the, the federal flank. And when they hit the federal flank, I'll hit the federal from the front. And we'll overwhelm them and not only open the exit into central Virginia, we'll destroy this federal cavalry brigade. And Longstreet knows that this is going to be a day-long endeavor. It's going to take like eight hours for this flanking column to get into place. But he's not concerned. He says, sure, I like this. This is what we're going to do. Meanwhile, up in Manassas Gap, the Confederates under Pickett there, Simpson and Cabell, are marching across the mountains back toward Chester's Gap. And they're replaced by Law's division of Longstreet's Corps. And that includes, of course, the Texas Brigade. Law has taken over since Hood's been wounded. And a very odd incident happens here. So Binning's Brigade uh, occupies the, the gap itself. Uh, the Texas Brigade is sent to occupy the mountains on the northern side of the gap. The first Texas uh, moves up to the apex of those mountains. Uh, it's a very tough climb. By the time they get up there, the troops are completely worn out. And at that point, Major John Woodward, who is the acting major of the first Texas, tells us, man, all right, let's, we'll take a break. We're going to rest here. And he's standing in the middle of an open field and he's cooling himself by waving his hat when he's shot in the hip. And no, there were no Federals anywhere close. The closest Federals they'd seen were like 1,500 yards away on another mountaintop. Nobody heard a gunshot. But suddenly Woodward goes down with this bullet that slammed into his hips. Uh, and they could never figure out where the shot came from. Uh, they had to get him down the mountain, which was no easy task, then get him back to Front Royal. And unfortunately, the wound turned fatal. It got infected and he dies on August 26th. So a very good officer in Hood's Brigade is lost in a very bizarre incident uh, that to this day really can't be explained. The major action, however, occurs that evening about 6 p.m. when Pickett's two brigades managed to get on the flank of Gamble, the Confederates attack. Wolford's hope that we could catch and destroy this Yankee brigade goes to nothing because, well, what do the Federals do? They get on their horses and they run away, and they can run very fast, whereas the Confederate infantry can't catch up to them. And just at the climax of the action, uh, Cabell and Simpson show up to reinforce Pickett. So the exit to Chester's Gap is open, and the first corps of the Army of Northern Virginia begins to flow through, followed by the third corps, because A.P. Hill has now come up. Uh, and can follow Longstreet. So you can see that by the evening of July 22nd, the Confederates are beginning to finally get through the mountains into central Virginia. Meade has advanced closer to Manassas Gap. Now he's hedging his bets. He's leading the Infantry Corps at Ashby's Gap and Snickers Gap north of him, just in case he's wrong, and the Confederates still might try and plunge through those mountains and cut him off from Washington, okay? But he's sending most of his force down toward Manassas Gap, and he's hoping that he will be able to shove his way through there, take Front Royal, and cut off what he thinks are two of the Army of Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia's three corps uh, in the lower or the northern end of the Shenandoah Valley. The man at the spear point of this advance is William French, Major General William F. French. French is an interesting character. He's got a bad reputation, and perhaps it's not altogether deserved. He was in command of several batteries of federal artillery in Eagle Pass, Texas, at the start of the war. Rather than surrender his guns to the secessionists, he marched them all the way down uh, the Rio Grande uh, and then got his troops on boats and got them out of Texas before everything fell apart. It's a pretty gritty performance. That made him go jump from captain to brigadier general. He commanded a brigade in the Peninsula Campaign, did well enough with it to get a division. But as a division commander, the man has very bad luck. He gets to attack the sunken road at Antietam. He gets to attack the stone wall at Fredericksburg. He's thrown into the breach to try and stem Stonewall Jackson's flank attack at Chancellorsville. 
think we all, none of those things worked out very well for him. He has learned caution and a very good school of caution. And so he's cautious now. So as he begins to move into Manasseh's Gap, William French becomes the victim of what to a later generation we might say are too many of the 1950s cowboy movies where you move into the Box Canyon and suddenly the Indians show up on the horizon and you're trapped and surrounded. As he moves into Manassas Gap, he looks at the high ground to his left and his right and is heavily wooded and he can imagine the Confederates suddenly appearing there. So he's very careful, he's very cautious, really doesn't want to do anything till the Fifth Corps comes up behind him to reinforce his effort. So he's timid, and this helps the Confederates a great deal because that morning, Hood's brigade had left, Benning's brigade, uh, and, and the rest of Law's division except Benning's brigade. Benning's brigade stayed behind until Wright's brigade uh, from Anderson's division of Ewell's corps shows up to take over. Uh, Wright is actually in arrest at the moment, so Colonel Edward Hall, uh, Edward Walker, is running the brigade. And he gets up to Benning. He's only got 600 men, no artillery. And as he takes over Manassas Gap from Benning, then he says, nothing to worry about. The only thing in front of us is a brigade of Yankee cavalry, and they're very risk adverse. They're not going to give you any trouble. So Benning marches off to rejoin Longstreet's uh, corps. Walker and his 600 Georgians are there for about an hour, and all of a sudden they start to see an entire federal corps appear in front of them. And they're sitting there and they're counting flags and more and more flags keep showing up. And so they've got a signal detachment with them. They wig back, wig wag back toward Front Royal. We need help. There are 23,000 Yankees in front of us and I've got 600 men. Well, of course, Rhodes and Johnson's division are marching from Winchester toward Front Royal. Ewell and Rhodes have ridden ahead to the town. They get the message. They dash into Manassas Gap to see if what Walker is saying is true. It doesn't take them very long to figure out. It's very true. And so they tell Walker, you've got to hold this ground. You've got to hold out as long as you possibly can. We will go get help. But that help is probably five or six hours away at best. It's going to require a forced march on a scalding hot day. All of this is happening in brutal summer temperatures. In the low 90s, the upper 80s, very high humidity. And of course, these troops are going to march from Winchester, cross two forks of the Shenandoah River, and then have to march up into Manassas Gap before they can get to the battlefield. And so Walker knows that he's going to have to make the fight of his life. So he deploys his troops into two lines, two skirmish lines. The men begin to stack rocks to make little you know, breastworks in front of them. And this probably wouldn't have sufficed, except that Fringe doesn't know what's in front of him, imagines that what's in front of him is a lot stronger than it really is. And so he doesn't do much of anything between 11 and 3 except to skirmish with the Confederates. And ultimately he decides, okay, I've skirmished enough. The fifth corps is coming up behind him. He feels a little bit more secure. So he punches through the first Confederate skirmish line. Walker gets wounded. And at that point, Captain Charles Anderson of the 3rd Georgia takes over, and he is going to mount a stellar defense. His troops don't panic. They retreat back to their second ridge line on, uh, on the uh, western side of Wapping Heights, where the first skirmishing had taken place, and that's going to give this battle its name, the Battle of Wapping Heights. But as one federal noted, we didn't scare the Confederates. They went backward in a gentle cow trot. You know, they're not panicked at all. So more than half the day has worn away without the Federals putting any real pressure. But now Meade is on the scene, the Fifth Corps is on the scene, and French is emboldened. So he's going to send a brigade to break the second Confederate line. This is the Excelsior Brigade, which had a very good reputation. It had been raised by Dan Sickles himself, uh, and it had its commander was on sick leave, so it gets a new Commander Brigadier General Francis Spinola, who's a political general. He's in the army because he's an Italian American and has political prominence. And he's seen service in North Carolina, but none of it's been very important. The man knows he's a political general, that he's not a military man, that he's a complete novice, but he's got the job. 
So he doesn't know much about what he's doing, but he is very brave. So he takes his troops down into the valley between these two hills, and he launches an attack. And it's a very difficult attack. It's almost a perpendicular hill the Federals have to go up, and they have to crawl on their hands and knees in some places, and they're grabbing bushes and small trees to haul themselves up. And the interesting thing about this fight is that the Confederate troops of Ewell's two coming divisions, Rhodes and Johnson, are beginning to show up on the scene. They're beginning to arrive, so the walkers held out long enough. Federal troops are on high ground here. Confederate troops are on high ground here, and the battle's taking place below them. And the men on both sides are cheering like they're at a football game. They're in the stands. They're cheering on their team, you know, so they're getting quite the spectacle here. And although the Confederates now have some sharpshooters on the federal flank and they're pouring a heavy fire in, Spinola himself has wounded several of his officers, the Federals managed to break the Confederate line. The rebels under uh, Colonel uh, Captain Anderson have lost about 25% of their strength. They're almost out of ammunition, but they had done what they were asked to do. They had held the ground long enough for Rhodes to show up and for Johnston to show up. And now Rhodes is on Green Mountain, which is the last high ground before you get to Front Royal. It's almost dark. The Federals run out of time to do anything. And so the curtain falls on what the Federals believe is just the first day of a decisive battle, because now Meade senses a chance to accomplish something. So he's ordered the second corps to come into Manassas Gap. He's ordered another corps to come down and be prepared to come into it. He tells French, first thing in the morning, you're going to punch through the Front Royal. Then three or four federal corps are going to pour into the valley to try and cut off Hill and Yule and destroy a good chunk of the Army of Northern Virginia. Of course, we know that Hill and Longstreet are already through Chester's Gap, that it's just Yule's corps that is vulnerable and really only Early's division, which has just now made it to Winchester. That night, Johnson and Rhodes quietly pull out of Front Royal, begin to retreat through the Lurie Valley uh, to the south. When the Federals get up the next morning, they push forward their skirmishers. Lo and behold, what happens? Well, nothing happens. And that's a big disappointment because around Linden the night before, Meade had massed 35,000 troops ready for his big push. So many Federals in such a small space, there wasn't room to lay down. Men had to sleep setting up back to back. Meade was ready to fight the big fight that he had been promising and had been demanded of him since the retreat from Gettysburg. But no, the Confederates are gone. Federal troops push on to Front Royal, but when they get there, all they see is the distant dust cloud of Johnson and Rhodes retreating down the Lurie Valley way outside any chance of pursuit. Early and Baker are diverted through Strasburg to come down the valley and cross below. And the Army of Northern Virginia has managed to get out of the Shenandoah, through the Blue Ridge Mountains, and back into Culpeper County, solidly between Washington, D.C. and Richmond. And for the Army of the Potomac, it's out of food. Meade hasn't been resupplied since he crossed into the Loudoun Valley. He'd lost all communication with the North. There's, of course, no railroad in the Loudoun Valley. He had told his troops as they massed around Linden, you're going to go on short rations because we're running out of food. They've been living on blackberries, both sides. In fact, during the Battle of Wapping Heights, men would fire their muskets, grab some blackberries, eat them, reload, shoot, grab blackberries, eat them, and on both sides, and one federal soldier said after Gettysburg, this was almost opera buffet. Uh, it was kind of, uh, but nonetheless, it had been a very important fight, and it has allowed the Confederate Army to finally complete its retreat from Gettysburg. And so by the time you get to the end of July of 1863, Meade has to pivot and head toward out of the mountains. This is a drawing by Alfred Wode of the Army of the Potomac coming out of the Blue Ridge, heading toward Warrington, where it can reconnect to Washington via the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and get resupplied. Lee is 23 miles to the south of Warrington, behind the upper Rappahannock in Culpeper, basically where he was when the Gettysburg campaign really began. 
So for all that had happened in late May, in June, in July of 1863, for all of the drama and the tragedy and the bloodbath of Gettysburg, where's the war at the end of the Gettysburg campaign? Exactly where it was when the Gettysburg campaign began. Both armies mauled, but interestingly, within a month's time, the beginning of September of 1863, both of them will have the same strength that they did on the first day at Gettysburg. So they're not licking their wounds for very long. And when you get into September and October of 1863, they're going to resume campaigning against each other. And there's going to be an awful lot of maneuvering and an awful lot of fighting uh, to come. So the story of Gettysburg that everybody forgets. The casualties, not much. 332 federal losses, only 50 of those are dead. 324 Confederate losses. Not a lot of bloodletting, but a lot of stuff that was very important because without these maneuvers and without these fights, the Army of Northern Virginia doesn't successfully get away from its Gettysburg defeat. And so we set up everything else that's going to happen in the second half of 1863, which in turn is going to set up everything that's going to happen at the beginning of the spring campaign of 1864. Thank you. Mm. And if there are any quick questions, I'd be happy to try and address them. Yes, sir. In your research, what did you find was the attitude of the Confederate soldiers in this time period? The question is, while I was researching this book, what was the attitude of the Confederate soldiers? It was stoic professionalism. They have seen victory. They have seen defeat. They've seen offensives. They've seen retreats. This is just Gettysburg, another big battle. And for both Union and Confederate soldiers, it was a great trauma. Uh, both armies are mauled. Their organization is wrecked. Uh, a lot of units are shadows of themselves. These armies, 46,000 men strong at this point. Uh, Meads is not a whole lot bigger. Uh, and so uh, it's hard. There's a lot that the troops have to endure, the heat, the hunger, the long marches, but there's not straggling. Uh, there's not disaffection. Uh, there's not any sense that we've been beaten. In fact, the Confederates are very much of a mind that we want to even the score for Gettysburg at the first possible moment. Uh, and you can look at the fight that Rice Georgians made in Manassas Gap. Uh, you know, they'd gone further into the federal line on July 2nd than any other Confederates got during the battle. And they had been mauled, and yet they're still willing to put up this very determined fight against overwhelming odds. Uh, Pickett's division, there was actually some fear that after what had happened on July 3rd, the Pickett's division wouldn't fight. Uh, but it turned out that it would fight, and it won a pretty easy and bloodless victory, which did a lot to boost its morale. Pickett was actually furious that once the Army got across the Potomac, he was assigned to guarding prisoners. He thought that was an insult to his troops, that that's all they were good for at this point. So there's very much a sense of we want to, you know, prove that we, we really haven't been beaten. Our army is still here. It can still fight. It should still be feared. And it's pretty clear from Meade's action that it is still fear. If you can think that Lee's about to resume the offensive after he's retreated across the Potomac River, that's an acknowledgement that you have a very dangerous and deadly and unpredictable enemy in front of you, and you had better be very careful. Yes, sir. What was the strength of both armies after Gettysburg? So the strength of both armies after Gettysburg leads down to 46,000 when he crosses the Potomac, 46,000. Okay. The Army of the Potomac is bigger. It's probably about 60,000, but a, a number of those troops are brand new. Uh, they've been hauled in from everywhere. They're not experienced troops. They don't have experienced commander. And so, and as Meade sees it, it's not raw strength to raw strength. It's infantry strength to infantry strength that matters. And when you look infantry to infantry, the federal advantage is not quite as large as the total numbers would suggest. And also Meade is convinced that the draft is a failure. Uh, it's not going to produce the numbers of troops that are needed. It's not going to produce the quality of troops that are needed. Uh, as Meade looks at things, 
if you look back at their history, so remember their, their history is 1862, 1861, right? Now we're not 1865 looking back, but we can do, right? In every campaign, the Army of the Potomac has been smaller, and in every battle, the casualties have been heavier. In 1862, the two-year enlistees mostly all went home. In the spring of 64, the three-year enlistees are going to be entitled to go home, and why should we expect they won't? And when they go home, who's going to come forward to replace them? Because volunteering is dried up. And if the draft is producing draft riots, it's not producing soldiers. And if you're forcing men into the army or they're coming in as you know uh, substitutes or bounty jumpers, they don't want to go fight. They're not going to risk their lives. So they might be mouths to feed, but they're not going to be able to do anything on the battlefield. So if we believe that in the next series of battles, the army will be smaller yet, the casualties will be larger yet, and the Confederates will probably be fighting from behind earthworks. I have to husband my strength. And if I'm going to lose large numbers of men, I have to earn something meaningful from that, not just push the Confederates back to the next river, not just gain more ground. It has to mean something. Uh, because otherwise, we're going to wind up with not enough men to win the war. And that's very much where Meade's thinking is during this whole six months after Gettysburg. The draft will do better, uh, and the three-year men won't go home. And Meade's going to have something to do with them not going home by refusing to have a second Fredericksburg at Mine Run, which if he'd done that, I think all of those guys would have said, I'm gone. <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, at the time, from that moment, standing in his shoes, you can understand why He's not sure his army should fight a battle. He's not sure it can win a battle. And he's not sure uh, about fighting a battle that won't gain some strategic advantage, which is a hard thing for any general to do in any war, is to fight a battle that actually really advances your cause versus just notches victories. Yes, sir. So the question is, you know, uh, what about uh, the Confederate retreat from Gettysburg to the Potomac and that there's a lot of fighting and stuff? And in fact, there are. The, the Federal cavalry is very aggressive and it finds chinks in the Confederate cavalry defense. And there are times where they overrun part of the wagon train where the wounded in the wagons and the drivers and stuff have to fend off the Federal attacks. Most of this is uh, Kilpatrick's division, uh, which uh, does a pretty credible job here. Uh, so, you know, me gets a lot of grief for the slowness of his retreat. Uh, that's a little unfair. The weather's bad. The Confederates had the head start. Uh, but his cavalry is being very aggressive. Uh, and uh, Kent Masterson Brown's book, Retreat from Gettysburg, is, is really good with that. Uh, and uh, there's another book, One Continuous Fight, that's about the retreat that's very good with that, too. Uh, so it's not like, you know, the Battle of Gettysburg ends and nothing else happens between there and the Potomac. Certainly it's not that nothing happens after they cross the Potomac and it's for the rest of the year, there's a lot that happens. You know, it's just the historians want to hit that fast forward button and get to the next great big bloodbath. So nothing else really matters. Uh, yes, sir. So the question is, if Lee's objective, one of his objectives in Gettysburg was to just, is a spoiling offensive to, to keep the Federals from. So if you think about it, you know, his logistical situation was desperate after Chancellorsville and had to be relieved. And the movement into Pennsylvania certainly does that. Uh, does he disrupts a federal spring or summer offensive? No question, right? But at enormous cost. If you think, though, that, you know, he's, knock the federal army out so that it's not going to do anything else. There's a fall offensive. The Rappahannock Station campaign followed by the Mine Run campaign and part of the Bristow Station campaign is a preemptive to keep the federals from launching an earlier fall campaign. So here's, here's kind of 
my big conclusion, and I know that you're there, <laughs> and I know why, more important. So um, is Gettysburg a turning point? And historians will argue about that forever. Okay? Would the war have been different if Lee won at Gettysburg? Sure, of course. Would it have meant Confederate victory? <laughs> the war would have gone on. It would have gone on in a different direction. What if Hooker had won at Chancellorsville? We never asked that question, do we? So could Chancellorsville have been a turning point if Hooker had won? Hmm. How about that? Right? So you can you can always do the counterfactual. Okay. If you look at what really happened, what does the Eddiesburg do? It's a big battle with lots of drama and lots of casualties, but it's one more big battle that just leads to the same stalemate in Virginia. The war in Virginia after Gettysburg is very much like the war in Virginia before Gettysburg. The armies are almost in exactly the same place. They recover very quickly after Gettysburg, like they recovered after Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg and Antietam. They're resilient. So they're ready to keep going. And, you know, it's if you don't build that bridge between Gettysburg and the wilderness, you can't understand why 1864 becomes the bloodbath that it becomes. But Gettysburg did not prevent the Confederates from going on the defense offensive in the fall of 63, and it doesn't prevent the Federals from doing it either. So whatever is accomplished is short-term, the short-term gain uh, by, for either side, and that's all. So if anybody else has any questions, you can find me at my table where I have my books. And with that said, lunch. <laughs>